I'm going to try and entertain you a little bit with some of the backstory to my journey through becoming a designer of sustainable buildings. Um, I, my practice, um, I established it in 1990 in London, um, and, and it's been a hugely influential project in the way that we set up the DNA of my business. And our business is about, our, we see ourselves as shaping a more sustainable world, that might be somewhat arrogant, but I'm going to show you some of the projects and some of the, the ripples that have come from, from um, working um, with, initially with Jonathan and, and the team. We're now in, in 11 locations around the world, um, working in kind of sustainable design across the States, um, in Asia and in Australia, as well as in the UK. Um, and so one of the most um, f fantastic things of my career has been able to, you know, I'm a climate engineer and it's really boring if the weather file is always the same. You know, so everywhere you work, th there's a unique climatic response to the buildings. And one of the things that we've really learned through um, studying context and place in the same way that maybe a master planner um, as they were talking about in the last talk, you know, you're, you're really understanding the DNA of this place. We need to understand the DNA of the climate. This isn't London, it's different. The breezes are different. The, the environment is completely different. We need to build differently a little bit to, to, rec re to recognize that. So we, we, we were sort of from an international background, and I sort of started my career a little bit after my favorite, uh, my favorite sort of environmental um, writer. Uh, but the point for this little sequence of slides is that the, the climate catastrophe has been, we've seen it coming for a very, very long time. This is, not, this is not news. The sad thing is it's only becoming news maybe for the majority recently. But way back in 1963, Bucky Fuller and his operating manual for Spaceship Earth was talking about, you know, we've got no instruction book, we don't know how to deal with it, but we are definitely getting it wrong. Uh, in, by 1972, Barbara Ward and the Club of Rome were talking about only one Earth and care and maintenance of a small planet and, and proposing a future that was built around environment and sustainability. We started to take a bit of notice in the 1980s. The oil crisis put the price up. Suddenly it was expensive not to be environmentally friendly. So we started to take a little bit of notice. But then the oil price dropped again, and some of the interest maybe dropped away. Jonathan talk, talks in his, his introductory talk about the, the, the hole in the ozone layer and the, and the, 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 the removal of, of CFCs, which was a Greenpeace campaign. Um, probably the, the single most successful environmental campaign that has, has happened on the planet, and hopefully something along that, of that sort of order now has to happen for us to change the way we, we go about our business as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a society. Al Gore and his inconvenient truth started to bring things into the mainstream when he started talking about CO2 as, a, as an issue. And in my world, where people are looking at the business implications of green, there was always a skepticism around how do you build, you know, you can't afford to be green, green's too expensive. And there was people like Dan Esty and Andrew Winston at Yale who were talking about green to gold, demonstrating how companies that adopted green strategies were actually riding a green wave and their share prices were outperforming other parts of the business. And that is never more true now, uh, sorry, it's, no, it's, it's even truer now that if you're, if you're not designing for green, green buildings, you're going to be, become life expired within five years. You know, you, every building has to have this as a principle. But it, it's definitely true. The Paris Agreement was supposed to make everything better. Maybe it hasn't yet. But in the last couple of years, what we've seen is a new awareness of environmental issues, whether it's through you know, these awful photos of the, of the, the turtles and, and David Attenborough, Greta and her, I want you to panic. Uh, and even what we're seeing around the world is cities starting to act. So often the... Uh, um, the initiatives for doing green building haven't come from state, gov from um, national government, certainly not from our UK government. I mean, the building regs are still 2013, for God's sake. It's ridiculous. We, you know, we haven't updated our energy code since 2013 in the UK. It's crazy. But we are finding that New York, San Francisco there, and equal, actually London as well, has got, you know, been pushing much harder on regulation, which you know, we're looking to take the best in global practice and exceed it here is our, is our ambition. Um, COVID's interesting because it has changed people's of, of awareness of what you can do if we all get together to fix something. Bill Gates said, COVID-19 is awful, climate change will be worse, which I think is a very, uh, a very good quote. Um, and it does show what happens, can happen if we get it all together. And of course, this year, suddenly everyone, as, as Greece is on fire, France is on fire, uh, the whole of the east, west coast of, of, of America has got these enormous fires, floods. It's, people are starting to realize that climate change is here, and it is now, and it is something we have to absolutely design for. So that's my opening soliloquy on climate change. Are we all suitably, suitably terrified and convinced it's the right thing to do? So a bit of history, um, because I think it's important that, that where I came in to all this, um, working with Jonathan, was this building he showed in his introductory talk, uh, the Greenpeace headquarters, and our sort of early development of a kind of a, an environmental diagram. We didn't really know how to do a green building then, but we started on a journey to do one. And then we we got on to the project called the Earth Center, which is 
was a radical, innovative um, uh, sort of theme park uh, geared around sustainability, sustainable outcomes. This is a great picture of Jonathan as a young man. Uh, have you seen this one, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this was our clients just on site in probably about 2000 or 2001. Um, and the building had, the, the project had a, t a lot of innovation in it. So it had at the time the largest PV array, um, and, but most, almost more importantly, it was built on, uh, on um, rejected forest timbers that were used, developed into a kind of grid shell by my colleagues at Atelier One, the structural engineers, to use a, a, basically a waste material to build a large superstructure to hold, to hold the solar panels up. And so you've got this wonderful, wonderful structure made of forest thinnings. Um, and the, uh, we also did an enormous amount of water management on the site. We built a living machine uh, with the architect Will Allsop uh, to, to basically to treat all the water. And the master plan was done by a guy called Andrew Grant, more of, more of whom later. So the first thing that we did at the Earth Centre that was totally radical was to, um, uh, it was built on a, a coal spoil heap. And we had to suspend a very large building on a very, on very soggy ground. So the structural engineers were going to put a huge raft full of concrete. And I said, so can we hollow this raft out? Can we make it out of, can we turn it into an air conditioning system? And in doing that, we then went back and looked into history to say, well, how is, you know, how is, and Jonathan refers to it as the Romans doing it. But actually, there's some fantastic, these are the, some villas in the Venezia in, in, uh, in Italy where this lovely image shows Prometheus, who's the, the god of the of sun, casting sun's rays down the building while the fire blows wind through these tunnels, and they come out through the floor, and they basically passively cool the building. So Galileo used to go here for the winter. So this is air conditioning before air conditioning, using caves and cellars. Termites do similar kind of things. The anthills are designed around... Uh, they're, well, they're not designed. They just, they're, they're made. The ants make them instinctively. No architecture degree or training whatsoever. So it's mer remarkable. So they build these huge chambers underground with these radial fins that uh, David Attenborough got in with a film crew into this big underground chamber. Um, and the moisture from the nest runs down. You get evaporative cooling. You get thermal mass storage to offset the heat the peaks. And the termites keep the queen at exactly 30 to 31 degrees. That's the back of the queen who's producing all the, the eggs. So you've got this sort of incredible biodiverse system and a system that uses nature and natural forces. It's, it's a conductive, radiative, convective heat transfer to drive, to drive buildings. So we took all of those ideas and we took the floor of the, of the um, Earth Center and we built a double floor, which became, became known as the labyrinth, and built these cross, cross walls, which then gave the, the, the slab stiffness and we pushed air through it. This is my early sketch from about 1996 as the air sort of came up through this labyrinth and up and out through the, through the building. Now, this was the first time it had been done, and most, most clients, when you want to be innovative, they say, where's it been done before? I want to be innovative, but where's it been done before? Show me where it's been done before. So you, you show them an anthill, and you show most clients an anthill, and, a, and, a, and a, a villa in Costozza, and they go, yeah, right, on your bike, son. Jonathan goes, let's do it. Um, so, so we built the world's biggest labyrinth at the time. Now, the ripple, so I, I couldn't resist the ripple. I was thinking yesterday as he was talking that, you know, that there's been the ripple effect of this has gone right through my career in all the buildings that we've done. And I think this is a really important issue for Project Phoenix because everything that everyone's talking about here is doing things that haven't been done before or in a better way or in a new way. And recognizing the impact that, that this project's had 20 years across the world, which I'm about to show you, is what really this is about. We're about changing the game. We're about changing up and giving people an exemplar. So when someone says, where's that been done? You go, it's been done in Lewis. It's been done at the Phoenix Project. You can do it. You can do it. So that's really where I feel this is so, such an important thing. So the, the ripple is, firstly, down in Melbourne. Uh, soon after we did the, the Earth Sensor, we won the competition to design this huge centre called Federation Square. Um, and I went down to the Aussies with my anthill drawing. You can imagine, I unrolled it just after a value engineering meeting on the project and said, do you want to build an anthill? Um, that was American, sorry. I'll work on my Australian accent for tomorrow. Um, and so the idea was that we had this big piazza here, Civic Plaza, and it was sloping, and there was nothing underneath it because it was sitting on a flat deck. So I sort of said, well, can we put a labyrinth in here, which was um, just interject it so we could condition this main atrium space that had open ends but was going to be, get very warm uh, to give it sort of passive cooling. So the Aussies amazingly said yes, 
Uh, and we built the world's biggest labyrinth currently. Uh, this is nearly 20 years ago now. Um, underneath the, the Civic Plaza now sits over the top of that. We'll come back to that. So, and these passageways make the air travel about um, 400 to 500 meters past concrete. Now, I should explain how it works. At nighttime, you push cool air through. It's always cool at night in Melbourne because the wind comes off the Southern Ocean. It, you cool the concrete down, so like a giant big battery, and it cools the concrete down. The next day, the air's hot outside. When it's hot, you push the hot air through. And on its long journey through these cool tunnels, it cools down and you've got, you've got a comfortable space inside. So it's effectively, and then we have it rippled um, just to give extra surface area and roughness so you get lots of heat transfer. Now that's a sort of big environmental radiator and that's a direct descendant, that's the sort of evil godson of, of uh, the Earth Center, but bigger. Uh, all the air comes out. The other thing we, did, we pioneered at the Earth Center was bringing air in through the floor instead of blowing it around so you're getting hot air, so the cool air comes upwards. And then this is the Civic Plaza, where, uh, the, which is the labyrinth sits underneath. And if you've been to Fed Square, you may not know it, but you're sitting on the world's biggest energy store under here. So that's, a, that's the first of the sort of ripple effects. There's another one in Ankara, in Turkey. And I mentioned about the weather in, 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 as being, a, being a, a prime driver. Ankara sits in the middle of the, uh, the Asian side of, 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 of Turkey. And the temperature goes up and down like this. And it's very hot in the daytime, quite hot in the daytime, but it's quite cool at night. And so what I look at it as a climate engineer and go, well, that's energy, that needs energy to cool, that needs energy to heat. So is there a way we can level it out? How do we flatten it out? The, the Turkish response is normally this. Okay, so they just, they just, and when you design something like that, you design it for that plus a bit. So it's always working inefficiently when the temperature isn't like that. So that's the first thing. How do you, as a climate engineer, how do you smooth out the peaks? So we took that idea and we said uh, we were building for the Turkish Contractors Association, which was not the... So the idea was to build a headquarters building for them. I think it's where they get together to rig all the bids they give to the Turkish government, but I didn't say that out loud. Um, but, so we, we proposed underneath that if it's a contractors association, not an M&E contractors association, which is a technical thing, um, you could put a labyrinth underneath, the contractors would build it, that could be part of the cooling system. We also wanted to put energy storage in all the slabs. So we take all that energy at night, hold it in the slabs, and in the basement, and then in the daytime when it gets hot, we just push air through to, to solve the problem. So here's some of the reinforcement with the pipes going in and the slabs to take the air through. And um, in the basement, a labyrinth um, made of actually sort of dense garden walling. This was, I was down there one day, and they asked me to approve the block. So they, we put the block in and then filled it. So we didn't do it cast. It was actually this poor guy was down here for about three months building these miles and miles of garden walls going, what am I doing down here? I think, building these tunnels. And so, and on the roof, instead of all those air conditioning systems, we had, we had some PV panels and we had a small blast cooler just for doing some water cooling for the computer room. And that was it. And, and this takes me back to my Bucky Fuller quotes. And if you, if you saw the trailer for this, uh, my talk, it, it, my favorite quote is that you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And in a way, that's what this building did, I feel. I'm very proud of this building because it was so different. So the next ripple is, is to, to back to UK, um, and just a few years ago, doing the headquarters for the World Wildlife Fund. And this is a building that um, we developed using a slightly different technology, using instead of labyrinths, underground pipes called earth tubes. Um, and the building works naturally in the daytime, uh, sorry, in the spring and autumn, so the building's naturally ventilated. So we open these windows, and all of the windows have little green and red indicator lights on. So if it's red, it means don't open me. If it's green, it says open up. I'm, I need to, I, you can, it's safe to naturally ventilate. And all the systems get switched off on those days. These vents open and the building just breathes. When it gets too hot or too cold, we then use the, bring the air in through underground concrete pipes, uh, which basically do all the air conditioning effectively. So in the summertime, instead of having air conditioning, we pull the air down 80 meter long pipes in the ground. They get cool, they bring cool air in, you push the air in through the floor, and the building's wonderfully comfortable. Um, here, one of the things we're looking at using here at Lewis is to, to do some ground source cooling uh, using the either open loop or closed loop um, boreholes to do uh, piping, put piping in the ground and use the ground cool as a source, the ground, sorry, heat as a source of energy for our heating systems in the, in the houses. Um, this also has a big PV array on the roof, um, and it was the first project where we really got into the other big nutty problem we're going to face here, which is embodied carbon. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute when talking about the project. Um, it got a BREAM outstanding rating. It has grey water recycling. But above all, it creates just a fantastic place to be. You know, there's, there's no sense that being more sustainable is worse. It's actually a much better place to be. It's a beautiful, bio, you know, lovely biophilic space um, and, and, and very comfortable. 
We then took some of these ideas to um, the USA. Uh, I was lucky enough to get, um, to get a job teaching over at Yale in the architecture school. So I've been teaching sustainability there for a long time. And part of the deal was, you come teach and we give you work. And I went, OK, that sounds good. I like this um, American way of doing things. So this was one of the projects we did. We've done about 30 projects on the Yale campus, bizarrely, amazingly now. But this is probably the greenest building we've done, which is with, um, with Hopkins Architects. Uh, and it's a school of forestry. The, the client was uh, Gus Speth. He was the dean at the time. He was a fantastic environmental writer. And here again, open loop ground source, which is the sort of thing we're going to be doing on our project here. Um, and underfloor air which, and, and all the kind of good things, plus a big uh, solar power system on the roof. It's another one of these buildings that gives feedback. And again, something we want to talk a lot about in smart buildings. This is an early example of a smart building, because the building here also says, you know, tells the students, open the windows or close the windows. They get a message on their computer screens, and there's little lights all around the building. And it's great. When the lights go red and they get the message, they all scuttle off and open the windows, being good forestry students. Um, and and uh, we open the vents at the top, and it's, all, it's a great sort of breathing building. So it's a really nice example of a kind of early example of a smart building. And this tells you all about the energy use and the f feeds back about what the energy is doing. So all this is what we're trying to build into our project here, is to have the sort of smarts to give you enough information to live, live in, a, live in a, make good decisions about how you, how you run your life. Uh, Gus um, has moved away from the school now, but he's, um, he's just produced a book, which literally I got an email about him this morning from him, which says he's just produced a book. It's, have you heard about this one? It's just come out. It's called They Knew, the US federal government's 50-year role in causing the climate crisis. So he's, he's got absolutely categoric evidence, and he's written this book, which just, I just ordered from Amazon this morning, because he got the email from his publisher <laughs> saying, order it. Next ripple, uh, the Kohler Center in, in Connecticut. So this is, you know, who knew? This was from the Earth Center back in, although 20 years before. All of the things we were learning there were about um, energy, about these earth tubes in the ground, about solar panels and PV and integrating green design into the buildings, all still sort of rippling through. One thing that's very interesting, and the reason I put this project in is because this is about a 30,000 square foot um, educational building at a liberal arts college in, in Connecticut. It's got 40 residential students and, 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 it, and classrooms and greenhouses and things. And in order to power that building alone, we need one acre of PV panels. So PV panels are great, but they have, a cert, they have a certain amount of capacity. And one of the big things we have to work on is how do we take that energy when it's available, store it till we need it, and then have it available when we use it. So there's a huge challenge in that for us in the way that we're thinking about the project, how much we look at batteries, how much we look at grid storage, how much we look at partnering with, uh, with external uh, sources to deal with that. And that's part of our ongoing dialogue. And as Joe said, a lot of this stuff isn't sorted yet. It's just it's in the mix. It's all the things that we're thinking about. So really interested to hear people's feedback and experiences. Um, amazingly, uh, Unisphere, this is, in, this is a new giant headquarters in Maryland that we just opened. Recognize that thing in the ground? That's, that's the same idea that we, that, um, you know, when Jonathan said, hell yes, let's build one, you know, now they're kind of a, a propagating uh, around the world. So who knew? Um, it's a rather ugly uh, headquarters building in Maryland, but it's a United Therapeutics. But the whole facade is PV, the whole roof is PV, and it's actually, it is actually generating nearly enough to run itself through the year. Um, the, next, the final sort of big project I'm just going to talk about, because I love talking about this project, is, is it's a bit of a circular economy project. It's called Gardens by the Bay. And I mentioned Andrew Grant who is the landscape architect on um, uh, the Earth Center. And we've become collaborators over many years and, and firm friends. And Gardens by the Bay was a competition to design probably what's now quite a familiar profile, the silhouetted set of buildings. Um, but it was uh, on, in a, a basically a rather unprepossessing piece of reclaimed land that was a park site um, by Marina Bay in Singapore. And they just built a barrage across here, and they're reclaiming masses of land. And they wanted to build a 55-hectare park uh, to give back to the community. And this is an amazingly, in a sense, a very generous gesture by, this, by the city of Singapore, because they live very densely. They wanted to have a very big sort of um, place to, to go to. So Andrew's master plan um, is, is, a, is, a lovely, is a thing of thing of beauty, but it's based around the structure of an orchid, with gardens happening at the nose, which is where orchids flower, I understand. Um, and it had two giant conservatories, one called the Cool Dry, which is actually in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest indoor conservatory, uh, largest uh, glass structure in the world. Um, and then there's also a, a mountain uh, conservatory. Now, the technology involved in delivering these buildings was absolutely mind-blowing because we're trying to keep plants that grow in these climates at, in a, on the equator 
in, a, in, a, in an environment where you've got very short sunlight hours. You only get sun for about well, exactly 12 hours a day because it's on the equator, but you also get a lot of cloud because it's tropical. Whereas the plants that are in the buildings are coming from the Greek islands where you've got 17-hour summer days and full sunshine the whole time, blue sky. So we're very keen, we, 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 so we, were, we were absolutely pushed to generate a huge amount, of, bring in a huge amount of daylight. So that bar is the amount of daylight you need in a conservatory. That's the amount of light you need in an office building or a house. So we had a massive challenge to sort of create these vast structures, but let, let enough light in on the equator without using huge amount. We were not allowed to use any more energy than a, than a, a Singaporean office building was our brief. We, we did a ton of modeling with the structure engineers, who again were Atelier One, our, our, our buddies, um, looking at a number of different types of structures and looking at the amount of light that came through. And it was a beautiful piece of structure engineering that you've actually got a very fine glass dome uh, with a, um, held up by a, a beam that props it. And even as we were looking at these beams, we were looking at daylight, technically, trying to reduce the profile of the beams as we went through to make it to absolutely minimize the amount of structure that the plants would see as they look up to the sky. Yeah, OK. So um, there we are on a, so this is a sort of a view up. Uh, and then we also had the problem being on the equator that we had to deal with extreme solar gain at certain times of day. And um, we ended up having to integrate quite a large shading system, which is also digitally controlled, so we can move the shades across the building depending upon the angle of the sun. Uh, they're all addressable and, and, and sun track. Um, so all of this was all part of a, an environmental control system that uh, uh, was then supplemented by cooling the floors, by bringing air in at low levels so that we only condition the very bottom parts where people are and we let the top parts of the building get warmer. And so we integrated in all kinds of devices just to spill cool air across the floors and around the plants to make the, basically, make the building operate. And that included this enormous mountain that sits in the middle where we also had to condition these spaces to get people comfortable, but also to keep the plants in warm, humid environment uh, so that you have these foggers that go off every half hour and completely fill, fill the structure with, with, with mist. It's fairly impressive. And the, um, some, of the, some of the skyways, if you've been up, have anyone been there? It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to go, and, to go visit. So how do we do that sustainably? Well, in, in one of the things that we found out as we were working on the project was that the, the client, the National Parks Board of Singapore, was looking after two million trees in Singapore. And as you drive around Singapore, you see these trucks going around, and they're always having to basically manage because the trees grow so fast. Every tree gets a haircut every two years. And we said, so where do those truck go, trucks go? And he said, well, no idea. So we went off on a little trail and we found out. And we found they were being taken up the, out, out of the city to an incineration plant and just burned to get rid of because there was no other way to get rid of them. They didn't have any, any use for them. So with a bit of a eureka moment, we said, well, what, what if we take the, tr tr take the wood waste and we actually mix it with packing case waste from the port to make it a bit drier, burn it, make heat, and then how do we turn heat into air conditioning? Well, it gets a bit complicated, but we, we basically use a thing called liquid desiccant. So you know when you get a, a product and you get a bag and it says desiccant, do not eat. That's something that absorbs moisture. You can get that in liquid form. If you heat that, you boil off the water and turn it back into liquid. So you can pass the humid air through it, you dry it out, you end up with lots of liquid. You use the heat to boil it off, and then you can pass it back round and round and round an infinite number of times. It just keeps dehumidifying. So we found a use for the waste heat. We also drive a turbine with it, and we, we basically use, generate power, and we have absorption chillers to make the cooling system. So all of that, all you can see of all of that kit is a chimney that sits in the middle of one of these super trees where all that energy comes out. And we, we run the entire gardens of 13 truckloads of locally generated waste every day. Uh, and we scrub, I should say, important to say, we scrub all of the emissions through four sets of scrubbers so that you don't actually get any soots or emissions coming out of it. So this is a kind of circular economy story around how you can start to take local resources, how can, what can we draw from local society, what are the things that, what, how can we turn a waste stream into something positive? Now you might argue you're still emitting carbon as you burn it, okay, there is an issue there, but they were doing it anyway, and there's, there's no other way to get rid of these materials, and they will, they will liberate that, but at least we've taken that waste and turned it into a virtuous thing. Um, so that's, that was one of our great projects, so it won the um, World Architecture Building of the Year and blah, 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 so it's been great fun. Project Phoenix. There's a myriad of, of, of issues as we're, that we're starting to unpack as part of our sustainability strategy. And those are around um, energy, clearly as a sort of key part of what I'm involved with early on. And, and that's really trying to um, think about how do we go for a zero emissions, all electric, you know, low carbon um, um, systems that potentially use the groundwater as our energy source, 
and put them through heat pumps. It's all, I don't want to get into too heat pumpy today, but it, those, those are the sort of technologies that we're looking at. We're looking at extensive use of power generation on the site with PVs um, and potentially partnering with an off-site um, source of PV energy to allow us to, um, to generate, to, 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 to have potentially private wire networks. We're also starting to talk about the use of kind of community uh, energy systems. So rather than um, everybody having their own energy bill or being able to go off to another provider, we, that the community agree to use to take, to take power from the most carbon effective source and that, that, that potentially one also shares storage between houses, between cars, between, um, between the different parts of the, of the development. And this is where it's going to start to get pretty radical because you slightly fall outside EU legislation around metering and all those things. So we're starting to sort of unpack some of those issues. How do you make real community, energy a community commodity, a community resource? How do we make that work? Can we make it work? And so we don't know yet, but we're starting to have those conversations. And that's what's so fascinating about this project's potential is that we can look at, at really challenging the ways that people are doing things. Because as the UK transitions to an all-electric economy, there's all kinds of trouble ahead because as everyone turns their gas boilers off and plugs in their cars and their systems, how the hell do you supply the capacity without building loads of new power stations? And then how do you not power them, power them with coal? So we're looking at all of that and how we can use energy storage to, to, to delay issues. There's also lots of other things around targeting that we're following um, and in terms of energy targeting and, and embodied carbon targeting. We're looking at the water, we're looking at materials, we're looking at all sorts of things, but because I'm hurrying up, I'm gonna go quick. Just go slow. We're also you know, really mindful of the time value of carbon. How do you, what's the priorities between embodied carbon and operational carbon? One of the things, so by embodied carbon is the carbon in the materials that we're gonna make things of the operational carbon being the, the energy, the carbon we will emit operate running the project over years. So this graph kind of shows what happens. So the yellow is the embodied carbon, and that all happens day one. So that's carbon we're going to emit right now. Saving in operational carbon will happen a long way down the, down the line uh, over the years. And at that point, you know, the question is, are there other technologies that might become available? What's the next horizon of these technologies? So we really are looking to prioritize, as you've seen in the exhibition if you've been in, all around the, the low carbon materials and the, the, how do you build in the most lowest embodied carbon way because it really is a priority for us as an industry. We're using some of the other targets like RIBA. We have a kind of roadmap to net zero which takes, looks at sort of passive design. So what the architects are doing right now uh, in designing the buildings to be efficient in form, efficient in, in insulation and all those sorts of things. I'm a huge advocate for, um, in part of, to do with resilience, in part to do with discomfort, of integrate, introducing things like shutters into the language of this, of this project. As, as climate change starts to warm things up, we need to be more defensive in our buildings. We need to keep the sun off the windows, you know, and that sort of thing. I know it sounds crazy, but you go across the channel, everyone's got a shutter. When you come to England, nobody has shutters on their windows. Why is that? Who's the smart ones? The French? No, can't be true. Um, and uh, or the Dutch or the Germans or everybody. Everybody has shutters, not us. You know, I think we need shutters in Lewis. So this is my this is my campaign, personal campaign. So I thought I'd get it in early. So all sorts of things that we're doing there. The active systems, looking at very high performance plants, at renewables, and then when we get down to net zero, looking at how the landscape and the adaptive reuse of materials helps us to maybe become beyond uh, carbon neutral into sort of a carbon positive world, which is where we really want to be in a kind of regenerative regenerative way of doing things. This is all getting a bit technical, so I might leave this. The important thing just to, to note is that what's happened in the UK in the last, since 2011, so this graph shows our grid and the carbon emissions from our grid since 2011, and it used to be right up here, and all of those windmills out in the, uh, out in the sea that you see, what they've done to the average is they brought it down to be about a quarter of what it was, um, sorry, 60% of what it was uh, in, in 2011. And since about 2018, it's been more efficient to use electricity to, to heat than it is to use gas since 2018. So it's completely flipped everything on its head about how we think about systems in buildings. So again, that's why we're sort of so preoccupied with this. And if you're, if you're interested, and if you're, and if anyone got this app on their phone? It's the best app ever. What's it called? It's called Grid Carbon. So you can, you can get, um, I'm gonna be a nerd now and show you it. The, um, so right now, the, uh, the UK, the grid is updating, updating, updating. Obviously, it's not a good thing to do on live, is it? Live on TV, when your phone decides not to connect to the internet. Anyway, it tells you what sort of the mix of gas and nuclear and, and solar and wind is. So if ever you wonder if it's a windy day, how's it, how are we doing? And we have had days where 
when the wind's blowing hard, you know, we've got 38% of the UK power coming from the wind from the grid. But it also highlights the fact why we need storage in our systems. We need to build storage in. And this speaks to some of the kind of options that we're talking about for how we put the grid together in this development to, to make the most of that. We're also, oh God, <laughs> this is a complicated graph, sorry. It looked good on my screen before. This is, okay, it's gonna be the last thought, last stop. This is just about ways of thinking. Um, and it comes from a uh, um, thing called Seeing in Multiple Horizons. And it's included in a recent book by John Etheridge called Green Swans, which I know is a big favorite of, of the team because it's about how do you turn this project into a green swan. Into the, it's John Elkington. What did I say? El Etheridge. Etheridge, got it, Elkington, John Elkington. And basically what he, he talks about is sort of first horizon thinking, which is kind of where we're, the end of where we're at right now, which is simple things like condensing boilers, super insulation, rooftop power generation. Second horizon is things, technologies that we kind of know about, but that are sort of, are, are now becoming the new normal, that are becoming sort of the thing that we do, ground energy storage, BIPV, battery storage, and so on, low carbon materials. So that's taking over. So our challenge is, is in really, in what the sort of thing that Jonathan's challenging us to think about, is what's the third horizon? What's the thing after the thing that everybody else is doing that we need to be thinking about to future-proof this developed design for 30 years, for 2030, 2040? And that's maybe about carbon absorbing materials. It's maybe about hydrogen. There's all kinds of new technologies that are starting to emerge that we mustn't let slip through our fingers and must make sure we're really aware of and ready to, ready to run with. So this idea of thinking in three horizons is a real challenge for all of us because we're used to thinking, right, you know, most, most developers say, I wanna, that's where we are now. Let's do something about here. You know? And what we're saying is let's think here maybe place ourselves here, but we're going to be there. So that's, that's what we're trying to do with this team is to, to drive ourselves to um, thing. And I'm, these are some ideas. I've got shutters. Look, shutters. Um, and we're doing a lot of work around advanced modeling techniques. This is a thing called a grasshopper script, which basically takes an energy model for a house and you can turn it into a kind of design tool that we're starting to apply to things. Should I be quiet now? That's it. So the team, sustainability sits at the middle of the team. That's the, first, that's the last thing to say. And there's a book, Invisible Architecture, and Bucky again. Long as not district heating in the sense that you would, you would normally know. So I, I don't think what we're going to be doing is using CHP or something like that and generating power and then pushing heat around the, the site. We, we think that we're, we will probably have a district um, ambient water loop that will be connecting to heat pumps in the buildings to do the, the heating in the individual buildings. So it's sort of, we've started to hint at a graphic here about a ground source thing and a heat pump. It's actually, there's another diagram that's got that on. So we, we will probably have an ambient loop, which will be a groundwater loop, um, potentially. And that's our heat source for the, for the heat pumps. Now, I don't know if you know, but if you have an air source heat pump, you have a box that sits outside that does, takes, sucks heat out of the air, compresses it, and puts it into the house. The issue with those is they, the, there's finding homes for them when you've got a lot of apartments and houses. The noise, quite, they make some noise. They've got fans and coils and things like the back of your fridge, but bigger. So the idea of using the water source is everything is silent and quiet and calm, and we just push the heat, we take the heat out of the ground, but not very much. We're not going to cause permafrost under Lewis or anything. It's just a small amount of heat gets extracted and compressed. So that's, that's the techn technology we're using. So we've just done it on a very large... Um, unaffordable housing scheme called Chelsea Barracks, um, where, we've, where that, has, that whole network, is that same network is deployed there. So it's something we, we know how to do, and, and it has been done before, but it's not at a sort of street level maybe, but in a, in a basement. So anyway, it's not, not CHP as you know it, I don't think, because that burns gas, and we want to not burn gas. Okay, it's a very good question, which of course we should be answering. I mean, I'll hand this to you, but I will just say um, from a personal perspective and from a human nature perspective, again, this is being recorded and I'm going to offend people, most development in Britain right now shouldn't be happening. Uh, when we look at the climate crisis and we look at the biodiversity crisis, it's inexcusable that we have development that doesn't leapfrog in the way that Patrick and colleagues are exploring to to enable us to radically pivot to being able to lead low carbon, biodiversity enhancing lifestyles. You know, I, I won't work on a development project that doesn't do that. If we're not able to do that here, it will not happen. Um, so no, if we don't reach these objectives, we shouldn't be doing it. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's, 
I, I, I wrote a book about the gardens by the bay, and it, at the end, my last chapter was, you know, should, can you ever justify building giant cool conservatories on the equator to put Mediterranean plants in? And in a way, you can't. And I suppose it is a challenge for us as designers because we, we solve the problems in front of us to some extent, and we leave it to our clients to have the, the bigger, um, the sort of the justification of, of, of need. Now, what I would say here is that there is always a need to regenerate when you've got old industrial land and brownfield sites like this. Way better to do this and put a good density of population on a brownfield site that is, you know, somewhat blighting the town, and to build really good buildings but with a very sensitive approach to carbon. Um, than to, say, spread out into the countryside and leave this. Because I mean, we need homes for people. We need to make, we need to, we, need to we need to regenerate these sorts of bits of land. So I feel on this project, you know, more comfortable than I do on some of our other projects, I've got to say, in terms of the way that the, the kind of the, the nature of the approach and the, and the need, the statement of need. And I, but I agree, there are, there are many, and I agree with you, Joe, there are many, many projects, and some of them we're doing, you know, when you can't really, you can't always say, I'm happy doing this, but you can say that I'll do the best of what's in front of me, I guess. And that's what we've always tried to bring to it. But it's, you don't always succeed in doing that either. Um, the ambient water loop feeds in and out of a, a water source heat pump. So it's like a, I'm feeding back some, an air source heat pump, but with a, in, in, the heat exchanger goes to water rather than to the outside air with a fan. That, um, goes into a heat pump which generates water at 45 or 50 degrees centigrade and that you feed around the radiators or the underfloor heating in the, in the houses. Um, you also heat the hot water up to about 45 degrees domestic hot water and then the plan is to top that up to 60 which is what you need for showers and baths and to avoid Legionella and things with a PV supply uh, or a solar, hot water solar panel on the roof. We're still bouncing in between those as options. So that's the, the strategy. The heat pump is, is like a boiler. It's the size of a small fridge it's not even size, yeah, it's a small fridge. And that sits in the, in the house like a boiler, just as a boiler would in the, old, in the good old days of boilers. We've done lots, lots of work on, the, on the, the source of the water, how deep we have to go to get it, whether we take it from near surface, whether it's aquifer, what, but there's, there is a lot of water in the ground. Uh, and we will take the water up, use it as a heat exchange, and then put it back again. So it's not, we're not extracting or you know, doing anything else other, other than adding a bit of heat to it. Uh, sorry, taking a bit of heat out of it. To be Getting colder is so much less of a problem in a passive house design, in a building that's designed with insulation this thick and heat recovery on the ventilation systems and all those things. The normal weather data we're using is taking a, a minimum of something like minus 10 as a, as a worst case, but it's minus four for a, a series of continuous days. Um, so it, it's a good question. We'll take that away and think about that. I haven't, you know, we haven't certainly gone beyond that because it does start to, what you don't want to do is oversize everything you need, but you need to have a resilience opportunity. The, the reality is that the heat loads are absolutely dominated by hot water in these buildings, not by the heating, because the, the, the insulation of triple glazing and the, and the thick insulated walls means that you've really got very little heat loss, even if it goes to minus 10 or minus 15. God forbid. I mean, the rest, everything else will go sideways if that happens. We just say, well, the water mains are first. And in terms of going the other way, we're, we're designing with trying to design with shutters and good cross ventilation and all those good things, but trying to avoid any air conditioning, obviously. Thank you.